everyone. I'm Kimberly. Hi, everybody. I'm Shauna. My name is Rob Schaff. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our big, big picture, picture project, project presentation, presentation on the Old, the Old Testament. Testament. Taking on a Jewish perspective, we will use the Jewish liturgical calendar to aid us as we read through the Tanakh, the Word of God, and remember the covenants established between the nation of Israel and God, focusing specifically on the Mosaic Covenant. We hope our presentation will help expose Christians who maybe aren't as familiar with the Bible's Jewish cultural roots to understand the Old Testament through that lens. To view the Old Testament as one picture, it is important to discuss the covenants of the Old Testament, which mark significant events throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. Specifically, it is important to consider the blessings and curses connected with these covenants. When God renews his covenant with the Israelites, he states in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life, the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Such consideration of these blessings and curses allow us to better understand the true importance of these covenants to the Jewish people and to the Old Testament account as a whole. Six key covenants will be considered in this discussion, with the majority of the time focused on the Mosaic Covenant established between God and the Israelites on Mount Sinai, since this covenant is, in many ways, the core foundation of traditional Israelite beliefs and practices. The covenants discussed today are Edemic, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Priestly, and Davidic. Let's walk through the Old Testament. As we do, let's look at these six key covenants and the blessings and curses attached to each. The most important scrolls to Judaism, in which give it its coherence as a religion for a nation set apart by God as his people, were those first five written by Moses, which are known as the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In the Torah, the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy especially outline the roles and responsibilities of the Mosaic covenantal parties of Israel and God. Throughout these five books, God clearly tells of the blessings he will bestow on the Israelites if they follow his law, as well as the cursings that will follow if they don't. Deuteronomy 30, 19-20. These books tell us about the origins of mankind, including how the nation of Israel arose through the lineage of the patriarchs Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The first three Old Testament covenants originate way back in Genesis, starting when God created Adam and Eve, the first parents of mankind, in his image. He blessed them to be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1:28. God gave them all the creatures and plants of the earth and sea for food, Genesis 1, 29 through 30. Most importantly, he walked in fellowship with them. However, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, causing God to curse the serpent who deceived Eve and curse the ground to necessitate painful toil from its laborers. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, doomed to toil for their food and face all sorts of problems as they made their own way on earth. Yet, even still, God provided for them by giving them clothing and the means to live and grow. In time, the world was overcome with violence and sin, so God sent a flood to destroy every living creature off the earth, but saved one righteous man, Noah, and his family, and two of every animal to repopulate the earth. It was Noah who built the great ship, the ark, that carried them safely on the seas until the rain stopped and the flood receded. At that time, God established a covenant with Noah, placing a rainbow in the sky as a sign that he would not send another flood. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Genesis 9:17. He also blessed Noah and his sons, saying, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Genesis 9:1. However, God warned, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Genesis 9, 6. 
Despite these warnings, humanity continued in its sin. Later, God called a righteous man who he renamed Abraham to travel to a foreign land, the land of Canaan, and make his home there. God made a covenant with Abraham saying, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Genesis 17, one through two. God goes on to say the whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Genesis 17, six through eight. He commands that every male in Abraham's family must undergo circumcision as a sign of this covenant. God warns that those who do not will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Genesis 17, 10 through 14. In time, as God said, Abraham became the grandfather of the Israelites. It would be nearly 500 years later before the promised blessings of this Abrahamic covenant truly began to see fruition when God made a final covenant with the new nation of Israel as it was preparing to enter the promised land after God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. God declared to Moses and the nation of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 24. He shared with them the laws required and the consequences that would follow if the laws were not kept. God was clear. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All of these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 2. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Deuteronomy 28, 15. This covenant was meant to bring the promises made to Abraham to fruition. Within the covenant, God gave the Ten Commandments, which Moses presented to Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before him all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Again, despite these warnings and the amazing blessings offered to us, we, the Israelites, failed and fell into idolatry almost immediately. Fortunately for us, Moses intervened, and God did not wipe us out right then and there. The Lord did lead us to the promised land, but that generation did not trust in him, so spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, learning how to trust in God through obedience. The priestly covenant made with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses, granted Phinehas and his descendants the position of belonging to a lasting priesthood because he, Phinehas, was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Numbers 25, 12 through 13. In this way, Aaron's descendants would be continually blessed with the significant position afforded to them. Let's go back for a moment to the main sections of the Tanakh. The next collection of scripture is called the Nevaim, meaning prophets. That narrates the history of the Israelites, starting from Joshua when they enter the Promised Land and try to take hold of it, but fail and end up suffering, which is the book of Judges. The people think they need to be like other nations ruled by a king, Samuel. They had not yet learned to trust and put their faith in God. The kings were no better and no worse than any other person. Saul, David, Solomon, they started out well, but fell away from God because they wouldn't follow his instructions. It is with King David that God established the final Old Testament covenant. When God makes David king over Israel, David was said to be a man after God's own heart, 1 Samuel 13, 14. The Lord declares, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. We see this covenant to be fully realized in the coming of the Messiah, which Christians believe is Jesus Christ descended from King David. After David, some kings were good, 
leading to people worshiping God, and others fell into idolatry and did stuff that was bad and evil in God's sight. The prophet Isaiah predicted salvation to come for all nations, despite the idolatry and unfaithfulness around him, while Jeremiah predicted the judgment to come at his exile from the promised land, if people did not repent of their disobedience to God's commandments. Likewise, God brought many prophets, such as the twelve minor prophets, as the Christian Old Testament calls them, who warned the Israelites of the coming destruction due to their disobedience. In time, the warnings of the prophets came true. Destruction fell over the nation of Judah, and the Israelites were sent into exile, just as the Mosaic Covenant warned. Despite this, God continued to protect and bless those who honored him even in exile. The final section of the Kanak, the Ketuvim, or writings, are a collection of books of wisdom, spiritual history, and tales of suffering, redemption, preservation, and restoration. These writings give us hope for a restored relationship with God, our neighbors, and ourselves, if only we'd hold up our part in the covenants. God continually shows himself to be faithful despite our faithlessness. In ancient times, the average Jewish person didn't have a copy of the Bible because there was no printing press. But God had already taken care of that. He put the priests in charge of teaching the people. See Leviticus 10.11 That you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. The book of Leviticus gave us specific dates for holy days and feasts to remember the blessings and curses of the covenant, as well as our heritage as a people delivered by God from exile. First, there's keeping the Sabbath, Exodus 28. After the Babylonian captivity, as described by Nehemiah, Ezra instituted regular Sabbath readings in the morning and evening services. In these, the whole Torah is read once a year, as well as the prophets. There are Sabbath offerings as well as monthly offerings, which serve to remind us of our covenantal relationship with God. Isaiah 66 sees the final future of Israel and mankind. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Each month the liturgy reminds us of past sins and the need for redemption from the Lord, and how he acts to bring all people to himself. On weekly and monthly new moon Sabbaths, no work is done in remembrance of God's creation of the heavens and the earth and the day of rest he instituted. It's devoted to rest and reflection on God's laws, and it's intended to protect us from ourselves and our constant drive to exploit creation for wealth and power. Psalms are sung before and after readings, and scrolls are brought out for public reading. So many psalms written by David and others speak of judgment, tribulation, and joy, teaching us to pray and lament and praise God. Everything anyone could experience is written about in the Psalms. Leviticus 23 tells us of five feasts mandated by God as perpetual reminders to our people and our children and our children's children. Pesach, known as Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, runs for eight days and commemorates the Exodus from Egypt with readings from Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the Prophets. Shavuot, the Feast of First Fruits or Weeks, remembers the promise of plenty in the land that God gave the Jewish people. It's 50 days after Passover and coincides with the completion of barley and wheat harvests. Traditionally, the book of Ruth is read, the story of love and redemption paralleling God's love for Israel, whom he brought into the promised land. Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is the Jewish New Year celebration, even though it's technically in the seventh month. It's a day of special rest and remembrance. This is a noisy day, with ram's horns being blown and other musical instruments being added to the symphony. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, a solemn day when we search ourselves, repent of any deliberate and accidental sin, and even unknown trespasses, making animal sacrifices to God in place of ourselves. It's a day that rids the community of sin and renews our trust in God, who provides the animals for the offerings in place of us. Sukkot reminds people that our ancestors wandered in the wilderness living in tents and temporary shelters, nomads without a land because of our failure to trust God. It's an annual reminder to be faithful and obey and trust God. This also became a harvest festival, coinciding with the reaping of grain, grapes, and olives. We rejoice, reciting the blessings of God and giving thanks for the harvests. When the temple was built, pilgrimages to Jerusalem happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Weeks, and Tabernacles. They were difficult pilgrimages, carrying goods, avoiding bandits, but since all males were commanded to go, we'd travel in groups for safety, making a holiday of it. During the week, we'd hear from the scroll of Ecclesiastes to remind us of the temporary nature of our life and our vain attempts to overcome it by amassing goods, money, or wisdom. Non-biblical holidays and feasts were added at later dates, which you can find on our handout. 
They serve as reminders each year to reflect on the history and the many ups and downs because of our failure to live out the covenant with God and his grace in renewal of the covenant when we repented. All of these holy days and celebrations serve to remind us of God's love and faithfulness to us, even in his discipline, and our roles and responsibilities that are to be a light unto the nations. Throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites hung on to God's blessing of life. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. Sent into exile and overtaken by the Roman Empire, post-exilic Jews longed for the coming Messiah who would bless them with a new life of freedom from their political oppressors. They longed to take back control of their promised land. However, the coming of Christ revealed to many Jews the deeper understanding of God's promises of life. Jesus did not come to offer political freedom, but spiritual freedom found only in new life given by Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, in John 14, 6. With this understanding comes a further understanding that God does not seek to restore merely the Israelite nation, but the entire world. The disciple Simon Peter speaking to fellow Jewish believers states, So if God gave them, referring to the Gentiles, the same gift that he gave to us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they, the Jewish believers, heard Peter say this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Rather than merely restoration of land, God sought to restore the relationship between himself and all the peoples of this world and to save them from a condemned life of sin that leads to the devastating curse of eternal torture apart from God. These Jews would come to understand that a restored relationship with God through the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate blessing and brings deliverance from the ultimate curse. Could this be the seventh covenant we are told to expect in Jeremiah 31? Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Thanks, everyone, for listening to our presentation. Here are some discussion questions to help you consider these thoughts further. Uh, first question, how does viewing blessings and curses of the covenant impact your view of God? Question number two, in the Old Testament, if the priests didn't do their job of teaching the statutes to the congregants, is it any wonder that they fell away into sin? Who was culpable? Should all be judged equally by God? In light of 1 Peter 2.9, which is the priest of all believers, what does this mean for us today? And question number three. The Old Testament covenants bind the human race together and provide the links we need between Jewish Christians. Yes, that is what you are, part of the Jewish family, and other nations and people groups of the world. How can we resolve our family differences and rid ourselves of the anti-Semitism that still pervades our churches and society? And a fourth question, how does the Jewish liturgical calendar differ in essence and intent from that of the Christian liturgical year, depending on denomination? For example, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Lutheran, Baptist, or Pentecostal? Question number five. As Christians, should we refocus our look at the OT as Golden Gay suggests and read it from the perspective of the Israelites as Judaism was instituted at Mount Sinai? Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye.